But I'll tell you something interesting. They won the majority of the two and three front wars, even though they were unsure of themselves. Remember, West, West, Western logic tells you, you can't fight a two front war. Look at what happened to Hitler. Our answer, we're not Hitler. We're not Hitler. Neither are we Stalin or Mussolini. We're Muslims. And we don't fall inside the rules of humanist history. At times, we do things out of the box and win because Allah says so. And we follow Link. So the Ottomans, as they sent the militaries out, they were sometimes winning but sometimes losing because of failures in communication between the Khalifa, who's supposed to be running the show and battling sometimes the scholars back in the kingdom, and between the courtiers or courtesans who were sending them word through their generals, this is what you're supposed to do. So sometimes they would get out to battle and they would be convinced that we're just going to have to wing it. We're going to have to decide what's best for us and to do what we think is best and to just go from there. We simply don't have time to wait because they're sending a letter back. And then as it went, <coughs> as, when the telegraph was invented, they sent a, telegra a telegram. But they said, we simply don't have time to wait for that to happen. Let's just go. We'll make our decision and we'll explain our actions later in a report when we return. And this is what started to happen. And so between the scholars and these earthly rulers, there started to be this gap. And the scholars still had connection with the military, but there started to be this separation between the military and the Khalifa. There started to be that split, and that's dangerous. Because the army, if the Khalifa is stripped naked of power, can merely turn and remove him. Remember the Abbasids. What happened? When they got sick of a particular ruler, the Turkish, uh, the Turkish uh, troops would snatch him from power and put in a new one. And that's what started, it started to be the case that the Ottomans were sliding towards this direction. The ulama are collecting the zakah, they're dealing with all the other matters, with the exception of the rulers who are dispatching armies and they're trying to take rest control of that. So there's this battle between the scholars of Islam and these secular earthly rulers. Now, when we come to Salim al the third. We mentioned that he reigned from 1199 to 1217 AH. We have to talk about his reign in some detail because the explosion of bid'ah and kufr that happened in his reign. There are some people historically that will curse him, historians. But I take Imam Jodat Pasha's position which is that perhaps because he's a temporal ruler, he did not know that the Khawarij reappear every 100 years. And maybe he forgot or was not informed that this was that particular one. We'd entered into another century, as we can see. And this was the time where the Khawarij would reappear. Maybe he was busy worrying about battles or internal things, so he simply was not aware of that fact. Also, we need to remember that, different to some of the other leaders, if he was concerned or the scholars told him to do something, he did it. If the scholars said, we need you to send these armies or we need you to do this now or we're going to command the armies to do this, he did not oppose them. And he was one of the few Ottoman leaders in the latter days that did not jail the scholars for opposing him. And he opened the floor up to hear what the scholars had to say and considered himself under their authority. Now, Salim al-Thalith watched all the calamities that I've mentioned, the loss of territories, murdering and rampaging, uh, the Atlantic slave trade. He saw all these things with dismay and every single one of them washed over him just like waves in the ocean wave after wave of different issue. We've lost territories in the Dardanelles. We've lost this, we've lost that. This has happened, this has been raided. We've lost this many soldiers. He had to listen to all these things. The French had torn Egypt away from its fellow believers from the years 1113 to 1116 AH, which disrupted shipments to and from the country 
and also instig instigated the beginning of the secularization of the country. Secularization did not come through Nasser. It did not come through King Farouk. King Farouk, although he was Albanian, was probably one of the most religious rulers in the latter ages that the Egyptians had, even though he had gambling and drinking issues. Secularization, that process was attempted through this stage from 1113 to 1116, and also Napoleon's continued interference with Egypt and trying to make it a French satellite. This is where it began. This is where it began. Rather than deal with these external forces, his attention was made to focus on the internal destruction being wrought by a tiny band of violent men that were intent on having Muslims believe as they did or destroy them in the process. The most disturbing aspect of this is that these violent men believed that they were not only true Muslims, but the only Muslims. So these people were internally a problem where the Khalifa actually had to turn his attention away from external issues and point the swords back in. Remember when the Ottomans are at the doors of Europe, battering ram, hitting away on the gate. A letter is handed to them. There's been a Shia uprising back in one of the provinces. You've got to come back. The Ottomans had to take their 20 cannons, melt back into the ether from which they had come from, go back into the Muslim world, and stop who was responsible for that. Otherwise, the Germans would be speaking Turkish or Arabic. And we wouldn't be, perhaps, where we are. Now, at this time... There was a youth that was born, now look at the timing, exactly 1100 AH. Didn't the Prophet ﷺ tell you that the Khawarij come every single century? Didn't he just tell, didn't he tell you that in, Bukha, in, the, in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari? Of course he did. Sadaqa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course he said the truth. Of course he said the truth. So he's born in 1100 AH. His name is Muhammad al-Amir al-Sana'ani, born in the city of Sana'a. He was born into a family of Shafi'i and Zaydi fiqh, but with Mu'tazila creed, he studied under his father and other personalities in his own city and continued after relocation to Sana'a, the capital of the then unified Yemen. Now we already mentioned who the Zaydiya are, their theology, their fiqh, is almost exactly identical with Hanafi fiqh. If you were to see someone that's, that was Zaydi that came into a masjid, their salah would pretty much be exactly like Hanafi fiqh. The only difference probably being that they don't raise their finger at all in tashahud. That would probably be the most uh, that would probably be the most uh, clear sign that their fiqh was different. But their theology. Because Zaydis have a theology. Their theology being that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Omar and Uthman were not oppressors and were not murtaddin, they were not apostates, as is the Twelver and, and Sevener position, but rather that Ali still should have been the first Khalifa. And as we mentioned, the ulama still classified them as a cult and still said it was kufr because of all of what had been mentioned about Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. So the ulama of Ahl al-Sunnah al jamaah and Muslim Orthodoxy don't compromise on fundamentals. And we don't compromise on sophistry and semantics. We want clear answers. So Muhammad al-Amir al-Sana'ani was born into a family living at Kahlan, but moved on to Sana'a, the capital. In his early years, he began to fall away from the Orthodox faith and practice. He started by stating that the Muslims had not only fallen away, but that most of them had rejected faith by committing idolatry. He then established his own fiqh, creed, and the like. The summation and rallying point came from his text, Tathir al-I'tiqad an Adran al-Ilhad, the creed's purification from the filth's desecration. Pages 36 and 38. On those pages he states of the Muslim Ummah, quote, they don't even know the true meaning of Tawheed. Rather, they are all mushrikeen without restriction. 
how on earth would he have come to that conclusion? Well, you have to remember, he's coming from a Mu'tazila background. And the Mu'tazila understanding is what? Is that someone is not held as upright until you know what their creed is. You can't pray behind someone until you know who their creed is. And his fiqh, as he began to make his own fiqh, is this. And again, this is an, a completely Mu'tazila position. A mujtahid's fiqh dies with him. So you can't make amal, you can't do taqlid of an alim or an imam who is dead. You have to follow a living imam. So when he dies, his ilm and his fiqh, it dies with him. It dies with him. And that position necessitated that there has to be a living example, which would be him. But he began the process by saying no. These people have not proven themselves. We haven't tested the vast majority of the ummah. And we do not hold someone as being upright until it's established that they have the correct creed. Well, who has the correct creed? Ahl al-Tawheed wal adl The people of Tawheed and Adl. And who's that? The people that understand Tawheed. And how do they understand it? By following the Quran and Sunnah. And how do they do that? By going to the texts. And if they don't understand or they struggle in something, what do they do? Ask us. We'll explain it to you. And so in one swoop, they'd stepped into the position of being a ta'ifat al-mansura, al-firqat al-najiyah, combining between the saved sect and the victorious group. They are the Muslims. The original proper Islam. The 12th century was a time of uncertainty for the believers. And I'll return back to Amir al-Sana'ani in a moment. It was a time of uncertainty. I mentioned that they'd suffered setbacks, that Egypt had been pulled away, and that Salim al-Thalith was confronted with the Khawarij. Now the Khawarij, as I mentioned before, are coming from a prehistoric innovation. Dhul Khuwaisira a man who is described by the companions as having a shaved head, a thick, unkempt beard, and clothes tucked up above his ankles. Sound familiar? You've seen it? Memorize this description because it is true and it should not be taken lightly. There's prophetic nature in this. It's prophetic, this behavior. Dhul Khuwaisirah had been unhappy with the charity he had received and told the Prophet wasallam. Muhammad, fear Allah and be just. This flagrant disrespect and revolt against the Prophet and the leadership of Orthodox Islam was met with stern rebuke and anger by the companions. Some asked for permission to execute the man, but they were told by the Prophet ﷺ not to do so. An ominous prophecy was then unveiled in which he said, Leave them, for they have their people. If you were to compare your prayer and fasting to theirs, you would look down upon your own. Yet they will go out of the religion as a hunter's arrow goes out of the prey he is hunting. If the hunter should check one part of the arrow, nothing is found. The same is the case with the other part and the other side of it. This is from the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, this hadith. The Prophet ﷺ also said further of the Khawarij, he said, out of this man's offspring will be a people who will recite the Quran but it will not go past their throats. They will go out of Islam as the hunter's arrow goes out of the prey. They will kill Muslims and leave the idol worshippers. Again, this is from the Sahih of Imam Bukhari. You ask yourself this question. What people brag and boast with glossy books and much braggadocio generating much heat and little light? What group of people do you know that do this besides the Khawarij. What people claim so much piety for themselves and swell their chests when they look down at the other believers who have missed out something of their salah? What people feel more pride in correcting you? What people take more pleasure in watching you stumble when you slip or when you make a mistake? What people feel more pleasure in depriving you of salam or telling you that you've committed shirk or kufr than these people? These are the very people and those people were prophesied 1400 years ago 